worship. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord, the Lord God is great, a great king above all gods. And the people of God said, Amen. Welcome, brothers and sisters, to Zion Hill Baptist Church, where we are living to love and loving to serve. We welcome all of our brothers and sisters who have joined us this morning through the various media platforms that are available. We hope that something in this worship service 
touches you and encourages you and brings you just a little closer to God. My name is the Reverend Kevin Jackson, and I stand here this morning as one of the servant leaders standing in the gap for Pastor Parker, who is away with his family uh, with the uh, passing of his brother yesterday. We want to keep him lifted up and keep the Parker family lifted up as he is with his family. Who, and Let us go to, to God in prayer. God, we are thankful for the opportunity to serve you this morning. There's been some, some trying times in the, in the land, God, but you've still been God. There's a pandemic that seems out of control, but you're still God. Folks have lost jobs and folks have lost, lost lives and it seems like the daily count continues to go, but you're still God. And God, we are here to worship you in spirit and truth because you are God, for you are still in control, you are still on the throne, and we are here as your servants to just magnify your name. God, we pray for, for Pastor Parker, who is with his family. We pray for the Parker family, God. We pray for all of those who have lost loved ones in this through this pandemic, God. We pray for all the loss that exists, loss of jobs and loss of hope and the transition that families are in, God. But we know that you are still on the throne doing what you do best. Be God. And so, God, we pray that through this service, we as your servants will be used to, to bring someone to a closer relationship with you. Maybe it's through the, the songs that are sung. Maybe it's through the piano that's played. Maybe it's through the prayers that are chanted, God. But we are just hopeful and encouraged that someone comes to a saving relationship with you through your son, Jesus the Christ. And the people of God said, Amen. And now we will have Sister Taylor Johnson that will lead us in the ministry of music. In 
the fullness of your grace in the power of your name you lift me up you lift me up in the fullness of your grace in the power of your name you lift me up me up. You are my hope, hope like no other, hope like no other. Reach Amen, Zion Hill. We have come to this time in our service where we recognize our tithes, commitments, and offerings. And Brothers and sisters, we ask that you give as God has blessed you. Your giving allows us to continue helping those brothers and sisters throughout the community that are experiencing hard times. It continues to to allow us to bless the least of these, to, to provide housing for the least of these, to provide meals for the least of these, also providing internationally. And so, brothers and sisters, again, we ask that you, that you give as God has so richly blessed you. At this time, you will see on the screen various ways that you can support this ministry. like to support this ministry these are some of the ways that you see currently on the screen Someone else who's worse off 
love than you be grateful oh, 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 oh be grateful hey, oh, 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 be grateful sign heal the scripture for today's sermon entitled trust is a must comes from the gospel of John John chapter 14 verse 1 then skipping to verses 25 through 31 and if you have your scriptures at home, you might read along with us. I'll be reading from the, the message translation. It reads as follows. I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I have told you, I'm leaving you well and whole. That my parting, that's my parting gift to you, peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned, bereft. So don't be upset, don't be distraught. You've heard me tell you I'm going away and I'm coming back. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm on my way to the Father because the Father is the goal and purpose of my life. I've told you this ahead of time before it happens so that when it does happen, the confirmation will deepen your belief in me. I'll not be talking with you much more like this because the chief of this godless world is about to attack. But don't worry. He has nothing on me, no claim on me. But so, the world might know how thoroughly I love the Father. I am carrying out my Father's instruction right down to the last detail. Get up. Let's go. It's time to leave here. And back to verse 1. Don't let this throw you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And quickly in prayer, God, we are mindful that your word has just been read, God. We, we pray, I pray, God, that you empty me and fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit, God. Fill me with your word such that folks won't see Kevin Jackson. They will, will hear your voice, God. They will be moved by your spirit, be moved by the comforter, be moved by the Holy Ghost, be moved by your spirit, God, such that they will ultimately understand that trust is a must. Trust is a must. And the people of God said, Amen. John points out to us in the text that the disciples were confused upon Jesus telling them that he was going to be leaving them. The text says first Peter was confused, then Thomas said he was confused, then Philip said he was confused, and then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other Judas, Judas Jude Thaddeus was confused. All of them asked for clarification about what Jesus had told them. You know, Peter, that beloved disciple who first confessed Jesus as the, the Christ, the, the son of the living God. Peter, who left the boat to walk on the water with Jesus. Peter, that servant who drew his sword and attacked the servant of the high priest. This same Peter who boasted that he would never forsake the Lord. 
even if everyone else did. Peter, you know this brother, Peter, who affirmed Jesus as the rock upon which he would build his church. You, you know Peter, and you also know Thomas, that deeply committed disciple of the master who struggled with doubts and questions. Doubting Thomas was his nickname. Thomas, the servant who said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe that he is risen. You, you know this brother Peter and you know this brother Thomas. And you remember Philip, that disciple who after the Last Supper requested that Jesus show them the Father which had led Jesus to respond, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. You remember Peter and you remember Thomas and you know that brother Philip and you know Judas. Not to be confused with Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. No, this was Judas, a.k.a. Jude Thaddeus, the, the writer of the epistle Jude, the epistle addressed to the unknown recipients that dealt with the danger of believing in false teachers and, and was ended with a call to remain steadfast in the, the Christian faith that dealt with the danger of believing in false teachers and was ended with a call to remain steadfast in the Christian faith. You remember Peter, you remember Thomas, you remember Philip, and you remember Judas. The text says that Jesus was telling them these things now so that when they occurred, they would believe. And truth be told, sometimes we're just as confused as these disciples were. We're walking with the Lord, yet we're lost. We're talking with the Lord, yet we can't hear him. We believe that he will never leave us or forsake us, yet we're still afraid. We are just like these disciples. You see, our lack of trust influences our inability to understand what Jesus is really telling us about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, or the Holy Ghost. We are just like these disciples. I can imagine that the disciples were still not convinced that Jesus' leaving could be a good thing. You see, after all, Jesus was trying to prepare his beloved disciples for his death. You see, their, their hearts were troubled because of the things that he had been saying to them about his going away. Their hearts were troubled because they did not know what they would do without him. Their hearts were troubled because they did not understand just what he was saying to them. They were afraid because they did not know what the future held. And we are afraid because sometimes and right now we don't know what the future holds. We started reading at verse 25, which quotes Jesus as saying, I have spoken these things to you while I am with you. In verse 26, Jesus says, the companion, the Holy Spirit, but the King James Version says, the Holy Ghost, who whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything I told you. So I can imagine the disciples telling Jesus, after all we have been through, after all you've taught us, you about to leave? You're leaving us? Yes, Jesus says, get up, let's go. It's time to roll. I will ask the Father, though, and he will send you another companion who will be with you forever. Notice that Jesus says, I will ask the Father, but he already knows the answer of the Father because he responds in the, the present future tense. And he will send you another companion who will be with you for how long? Forever. Jesus knows that his disciples are scared. They hear him, but their fear has trumped their faith. So Jesus personalizes the conversation just a little bit more, taking it just a, a little bit deeper. He explains that the companion is the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. Then Jesus affirms them by saying, you know him because he lives with you and he will be with you. In other words, the Holy Spirit, the companion, the paraclete, the helper, the spirit of truth is not outside of you, but dwells inside of you, dwells inside of us. This same spirit of truth that convicts your mind when you 
when you do something you know is dead wrong. This is that same spirit of truth that allows you to discern the intentional politicizing of the COVID-19 pandemic by those whose ultimate concern is profit over principle. This is that same spirit of truth that causes you to stand courageously and face those self-made demigods who perpetuate sexism, racism, classism, and narcissistic ideologies that divide us rather than unite us. This is that same spirit of truth that gives you peace in the middle of a storm. But the text says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's some good news, y'all. Why should our hearts not be troubled or afraid? Because Jesus answers this question by saying, peace I leave with you. From this text, we can take at least four important lessons about peace. The first lesson that we need to focus on about peace is that you need to adjust your focus. In other words, change the way you see your situation and the way you see your situation will change. We all need some peace. The Bible speaks of peace with God. COVID-19 has caused a temporary disruption to life as we once knew it. Some of us have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and we need some peace. Some of us are living self-quarantine with COVID-19. We need some peace. Some of us have lost jobs and businesses, and we need some peace. The peace that Jesus is talking about takes place when you surrender to God and are no longer at war with God. We are at war with God when we are, when our worrying takes over our daily existence. You see, some of us worry from sunup to sundown. We're just a nervous wreck. We can't eat and we can't sleep. We're, we're mean-spirited and, and irritated. Most time we worry about things and situations that we ultimately have no control over. You and me are at war with God and there's just no possible way for us to say we trust God and to worry about stuff that we have no control over. The first thing we need to do is focus on, on in these lessons is adjust your focus. The second thing we need to do is to give your pain to God through prayer. Give your pain to God through prayer. The, the Bible speaks of the peace of God. You demonstrate this peace of God when, that has been imparted within you when you act peaceful in the midst of your worst storm. It's not your own doing, but it is the Spirit of God that whispers in your ear, don't react. Don't fight back, just walk away. The second thing we need to do is to give your pain to God through prayer. If we, if we pray and we leave our burdens with God, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and guide our minds through Christ Jesus. You see, God is telling us to focus on him, to think about God, to pray to him, and to think about God again. The Apostle Paul says that we're to force ourselves to think about the things of God and not the things that are bothering us. The third lesson that we can take from this text is that we should dwell on our victories instead of dwelling on our circumstances. You see, your circumstance may seem impossible, but that doesn't mean you always have to dwell on it. Reorient the focus of your thoughts. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good rapport, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Focus on the victories that you've had with God. Even if they're small, focus on those victories. Didn't you know how you were going to, you didn't know how you were going to get out of that abusive relationship, but you began to practice self-love. That's a victory. Focus on that. You didn't know how you were going to pay your bills. You didn't know how you were going to pay your mortgage. You didn't know how you were going to make it from day to day, but, but God came through. That's a victory. Focus on that. You didn't know how you were going to pass that test, but God came through with a new strategy. That's a victory for you to focus on. The good memories of life you share with a family member who has passed on from labor to reward. 
overtook the pain of your grieving. That's a victory, something to celebrate. You should dwell on your victories instead of dwelling on your circumstances. And lastly, you should stay calm and don't give up. Paul says, keep doing the things that God has told you to do. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. What is the answer to the distress that you feel in times of trouble? You see, that, that answer is found back in verse 1 of the text that we read. It says, the answer is to, to trust God, but to also trust in me. You see, trust, this trust we're talking about is not just a, a mere mental thing. This is a trust that moves beyond our understanding. One of the great truths of, lives, of life is that there are times when life just doesn't make sense. We have all experienced times in life when experience defies logic and leaves us with a complete lack of understanding. Life can absolutely be beyond our ability to comprehend and beyond our ability to take control. Trust means that you lean on God at all times, in all situations, and in every way possible. Life is never fair. Let me say that again. Life is never fair and never totally free of pain and never beyond difficulties. But, you see, trusting God is not just a slogan, it's a stance. Trusting God is not just a movement, it's about changing your mentality. Trusting God is not just about your commitment, it's about your surrendering to God's will. Trusting God is not about separating ourselves, ourselves from the bad stuff, it's about always pursuing God's best, the good stuff. Trusting God is not just about denying yourself, it's about taking up your cross and putting God first in all things. Trust in God, but also trust in me. Don't give up. Don't give in. God will see you through. All things work together for those of them who, who love the Lord. We're living in a challenging life. It's, it's a hard life, and it's a hard knock life, and it's filled with uncertainties. But that doesn't mean that we should give up or that we should give in. Trouble don't last always. This is why trust is a must. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. You see, we should trust in God just as the text tells us, but to also trust in Christ Jesus. Trust is a must. Trust God and never doubt for in time he'll bring you out. Trust is a must. That is the, the word of God for the people of God. And we've come to this time in our service, Zion Hill, where it's our invitation to Christian discipleship. We've come, brothers and sisters, to, to invite those folks who are watching us by streaming to, to watch those, to disciple those folks who are may have been moved by some form of the ministry, moved by the, the piano playing, moved by the, the songs that were sung, moved by the prayers, moved by your prayers to unite with this body of Christ. And as you look towards the screen, you will see a number displayed and an email address. And if you felt moved through this service to join with this body of believers, to, to join with this body of servants, we ask that you would call the number listed on your screen. There is someone there waiting to receive your call or to email us. The number at 404-844-4282 or zhbc at zionhill.org. Zane Gray 
Zion Hill. In case you tuned in uh, towards uh, just now or a little bit after the service started, my name is Reverend Kevin Jackson and I'm one of the servant leaders here at Zion Hill and I'm standing in for Pastor Parker this morning who was with his family because of the passing of his brother yesterday who was suffering from a lengthy illness, uh, a non-COVID-19 related illness, but a lengthy illness. And so we want to make sure we we keep Pastor Parker and his family lifted up in prayer. And as we begin to, to scroll the, the Zion Hill prayer scroll, we, we want to make sure that we are lifting up the Parker family on this prayer scroll that you will now see on your screen. And these are the names of brothers and sisters that have called in or written in or sent some note in to the church asking to be added to the, to the prayer scroll. 
And as you, as you watch this prayer scroll, Zion Hill, we, we ask that you meditate and that you, you pray for these brothers and sisters by name, if possible, lifting them up, not having to know what their situation is, but just knowing that they need and they stand in the need of prayer. Amen, Zion Hill. And as we, as we go in our, to our closing prayer, I would ask that you just bow your heads with me. God, we pray for those names who were added to the prayer scroll. We know that you see all, God. We know that you know all. We know that you're here in the midst with us of this uncertainty that we're in, the social distancing that we're in, the the loss that we have suffered, the transition that we're in. God, we know that you are with us, and we know that you are with us because just as in the text, you have, your son has left and requested that the Holy Spirit be with us. We specifically ask God for, for your grace and your mercy on 
the angel of this house, Pastor Parker and his wife, Sister Sheila Parker, and the entire Parker family, God. Most of all, God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you and worship today. And the people of God said, amen. Now, I would ask that you receive this, this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make divine face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord God, our God, our mother, and our God, our Father, lift up countenance upon you and give you everlasting peace. Amen, amen, and amen.